Howdy y'all, today we're going to talk about a conflict between George Bush and Saddam Hussein. Uh, that's the wrong George Bush, and that's Osama Bin Laden. There we go. The date is August 1990. After two terms in office, Ronald Reagan has left the presidency and passed the baton of freedom to his former vice president, George H.W. Bush. Margaret Thatcher, the conservative Iron Lady, is still running the show in the United Kingdom. Relations with Moscow and Gorbachev have been steadily improving, and now the Soviet Union is on the brink of collapse. H.W. Bush is about to negotiate with the Soviet Union to reunify Germany. Now that Mao is finally dead, China can begin its long-awaited economic revolution. And Iraq has just invaded Kuwait. Wait, what? Slow down. That last part was important. What just happened? Saddam Hussein, the dictator of Iraq and the ruler of the fourth largest military in the world, owes a lot of money to Kuwait, following his unsuccessful eight-year war with Iran. Saddam is an old-fashioned, might-makes-right kind of guy, so in order to get out of paying the money, and to settle disputes over some oil fields, he decides to invade. Someone's threatening our freedom? And it's not the Soviets? America and their NATO allies are perplexed. After preparing for a Soviet invasion of West Europe since World War II, the idea of a conflict all the way in the Middle East never occurred to them. Better get used to it. After invading Kuwait and controlling 20% of the world's known oil reserves, Saddam Hussein stages his forces along Kuwait's southern border. To the rest of the world, it looks like he's preparing to invade Saudi Arabia. And this makes everyone uncomfortable, since this will give Saddam control of the three countries with the most known oil in 1990. As the Bush administration comes to terms with the situation, H.W. Bush gives a speech from the White House. This will not stand. This will not stand, this aggression against uh, Kuwait. I've got to go. Coming from the calm and patient Bush, this is the equivalent of a normal person throwing a chair. The administration sets to work, rallying support from the UN and Congress. Hey, Saudi Arabia, we can defend your oil from Saddam. Eh, uh, we're kind of okay with this, and we don't think you're serious about doing anything. We are serious, and we know that deep down, you aren't okay with this at all. Fine, you can enter our holy land, but only if one, you bring enough to finish the job, and two, leave as soon as it's over. After the protracted war in Vietnam, the United States doesn't hesitate to accept these conditions. American and coalition forces enter Saudi Arabia to prevent Saddam from invading South. This becomes known as the defensive operation codenamed Desert Shield, because it, you know, shielded the desert. Although, Oil Shield would have been more honest. What? Infidels in the Holy Land? To prove their legitimacy, America tries to form a diverse coalition, especially with the other Arab nations. In order to get Egypt on board, their $6.7 billion debt is forgiven. The coalition is successful, and no less than 28 countries join forces to retake Kuwait. In November, President Bush decides to massively increase the force in Saudi Arabia. The leader of our military forces in this conflict, the U.S. CENTCOM commander, General Schwarzkopf, justifies this increase by stating that we are outnumbered 2 to 1, and in order to attack the fortified Iraqis, we would need a comparative advantage of 5 to 1, which we did not have yet. The UN passes a resolution ordering Saddam Hussein to withdraw from Kuwait by January 15th, or else. On Friday, January 11th, the United States holds a vote authorizing the use of force if Saddam remains in Kuwait after the January 15th deadline. The resolution passes and H.W. Bush breathes a sigh of relief. January 15th ends with Saddam still firmly in Kuwait. It's time to spread some freedom. On January 17th, U.S. and coalition forces begin beating Saddam into submission with a three-part air raid. 1. Destroying Iraqi air units, chemical, nuclear, and biological manufacturing plants, command and control centers, and SCUD missile sites. 2. Destroying missile bases. 3. Destroying Iraqi ground forces to pave the way for the ground assault. Allied forces also destroy logistical targets such as fuel depots and power stations. Day and night, sorties go out from Saudi Arabia, aircraft carriers in the Gulf, and even a NATO airfield in Turkey. On January 20th, Saddam retaliates by launching SCUD missiles at one of the only countries not bombing him. These attacks continue for over a month and on January 22nd result in three deaths and 96 casualties. Anxious to retaliate and perhaps join the coalition, Israel begins to charge their power level. But the Arab nations and the coalition don't even recognize Israel as a state, so America convinces Israel to sit this one out, to hold the fragile coalition together. Saddam realizes that he's losing control of the air, so he saves the rest of his airplanes by moving them to Iran airspace. 
On Friday, February 22nd, Bush issues an ultimatum to Saddam. Withdraw from Kuwait by noon on Saturday, February 23rd, or face a ground war. Once again, Saddam ignores coalition demands. Initially, the Navy and the Marines were staged to conduct an amphibious operation from the Gulf Coast. But this operation was canceled, since commanders concluded that casualties would be unacceptably high, so the Marines were moved to other fronts. The ground invasion begins on the 24th of February. After disabling Saddam Hussein's visibility, roughly half of the U.S. ground forces flanked the Iraqis by maneuvering hundreds of miles to the west, while the rest of our forces fixed the enemy in place along the fortified Kuwait-Iraqi border. Before the ground war, Saddam claimed that the fortified border along the Kuwait-Saudi border, consisting of minefields, barbed wire, anti-tank ditches, berms, and oil-filled trenches, was an impenetrable barrier. Using rakes, rollers, and mine-clearing line charges, allies create incisions in the barrier and funnel through. With most of the Iraqi forces on the border below 50% strength and supported by inaccurate artillery, the U.S. and coalition forces cut through them like a hot knife through butter. Meanwhile, 7th Corps and coalition forces flanking west managed to pass through the Saudi-Iraqi border practically unopposed. From there they turn east while the French form a screen to the west to protect the coalition from any Iraqi reinforcements. Caught by surprise, the dug-in Iraqi forces are usually facing the wrong way and provide little resistance against 7th Corps. General Schwarzkopf acknowledges that the plan needs to be accelerated in order for the flanking elements to keep up with the main assault, so 7th Corps ends up attacking 15 hours ahead of schedule. In fact, the thing slowing coalition forces the most are the sheer number of Iraqi infantry soldiers surrendering. However, Iraqi armored units provide more resistance. Before the day is over, U.S. Marines meet with Iraqi armored counterattacks. After the counterattacks, Marine forces reach Al Jabir Airport. Around this time, Joint Force Command North reach their targets and turn east to combine forces with Joint Force Command East in retaking Kuwait City. After successfully flanking the enemy, units from the 101st Airborne Division push north to the Euphrates to cut off an Iraqi retreat from Highway 8, while 7th Corps push into Kuwait from the west, racing toward the elite Iraqi Republican Guard in a giant Battle Drill 1 Alpha formation. Meanwhile, naval feints tie down Iraqi forces along the coast, preventing them from assisting the front lines. By the third day, the 7th Corps reached Saddam's best, the elite Republican Guard. This results in the most intense fights of the war. As coalition forces near Kuwait City, Iraqi units flee in a frantic convoy of stolen vehicles. Coalition air forces surround their avenue of escape and shoot them down like fish in a barrel. This event becomes known as the Highway of Death. After what remains of the Republican Guard begin the retreat, there is no major force left to fight within Kuwait. Joint Force Command North and Joint Force Command East finally retake Kuwait City. Shortly afterwards, a ceasefire is called. The entire ground war only lasts 100 hours. Fearing that Saddam Hussein will not show up, the Allied commanders don't demand him to come to the peace talks. Instead, they meet with Saddam's highest ranking generals to discuss Iraq's withdrawal from Kuwait. The generals agree to the coalition's terms, and Iraq withdraws. With Kuwait once again a sovereign nation, coalition forces in the region return to their respective countries. America becomes a dominating player in the Middle East. Norman Schwarzkopf becomes a national hero. President Bush's popularity briefly rises to an unprecedented 89%. All the Arab nations go back to hating Israel, and everyone lived happily ever after. Well, not really, but that's a story for another time. Okay. First, I'd like to apologize for not addressing every aspect of the war. Second, I don't want to completely copy another <coughs> more successful <coughs> YouTuber, so I also want to finish analyzing this war, but the kind of analysis I want will practically double the length of this video, so I'll save that for another time. Until then, I leave you with rare footage of a mother plane feeding her baby tornadoes in midair so they can spread freedom to the far reaches of Iraq. Isn't nature beautiful?